Well, good morning and welcome to worship here at Starkville First United Methodist Church. We're glad you're here, whether you're with us in person or whether you're joining us on live stream or on broadcast television. We're delighted that you're able to share this time together with us. Just a couple of announcements. Reminder, we're still working on plans for Sunday school and all the things that go with that starting later on in September, so be aware of that. And we'll be uh, letting you know kind of what the schedule will be doing with that in the days ahead. And also just a reminder that services have ramped up at Connection at 11 o'clock. And if you've got some questions about that, contact Charlie Harper and he'll get you plugged in to what we're doing down there. And then a big announcement for this afternoon, we are doing a blessing of the backpacks. It'll be done as a, a walkthrough, not a drive by. Uh, it'll be in the Christian Life Center from three to five. You come, you'll receive your gift bags for children, youth, adults, who are teachers, and we'll pray over you and move you on through the line and you'll be ready to go for the semester. We want you to take part in that. Now, we're just always reminding people during this transition back to in-person services of all our safety protocols and our hygiene, hand washing, and all that kind of stuff. So with that in mind, I ask that you give your attention to our video. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is your pastor speaking. On behalf of our whole team here at Starkville First United Methodist Church, we want to thank you for being with us today. Things have changed a little bit since the last time you were here, and we'd like you to give a little attention now to the safety video that we're going to show. Thanks for being with us, and God bless. Welcome passengers. Please take note of the entrances on the south side of the building. Make sure to enter and exit exclusively through the Lampkin Street doors. We are so excited to have you with us, but we request that you wear a mask. On behalf of others, we thank you. Also, if you are in need of an assisted hearing device, you can find one as well as single-use earbuds at each one of the exits. Upon arrival, you will be greeted by one of our friendly ushers who will guide you to your seat. We cannot offer you a hug or a handshake, but we can offer a complimentary wave hello. During service, we will be providing entertainment through a variety of musical options, including instrumental and pre-recorded vocal performances. Sadly, we will not be providing nursery services, nor will our ushers be passing through the cabin with offering plates. If your little one gets restless, feel free to let them watch Sunday School on a phone. And if you wish to give, offering boxes are located at the main exits. At the end of the service, our ushers will lead each party out, starting from the back pews and ending in the front ones. Please remember to grab all your personal effects when exiting. We here at FUMC recognize the wide range of worship opportunities these days, and our staff thank you for choosing to spend your morning with us. And without further ado, fasten your seatbelts, turn off your digital devices, and enjoy the service. With that, let's prepare our hearts for worship as we share in our call to worship. We find it in the 19th Psalm this morning. Let's read responsibly. The law of the Lord is perfect. The decrees of the Lord are sure. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is clear.
stand with me as we affirm our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. See by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. While you are standing, would you welcome everybody with the courteous wave that Maddie mentioned? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm Miss Audrey, and this is my friend, Sirius. And we're so glad to see y'all this morning. So I wanted to show you a couple of things. Right, Sirius? I know. Um, so I've got a couple of backpacks here. So this is my big backpack for when I go hiking. I've got all kinds of pockets to carry everything I need, like food, my sleeping bag, my tent. This is my backpack for school. So it's got things so I can put my laptop, my books, pencils. And then even Sirius has his backpack for when he goes on trips and he carries his food, his favorite toys in it. And so you can see we all have different backpacks and they're all different sizes. Well, I just wanna remind us all that at different times in our lives, we might have different backpacks for different things that we're carrying. And by that I mean sometimes some of us might be carrying heavier burdens or harder things we're dealing with, and sometimes our burdens are light or smaller. But no matter what, we're all always carrying something. And so in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 7, it says that we can cast all of our cares on Jesus because he cares for us. Right, Sirius? Yeah. And so that reminds us that no matter if our burdens are smaller or bigger, Jesus can help us carry them. So this week, as we're all starting back to school, as you're wearing your backpacks, remember that as you carry your backpacks, if you have anything else you're carrying, anything that you're worried about or uh, making you anxious, um, you can ask Jesus to help you carry those things. And we can always help our sisters and brothers carry those things too. All right, well, let me say a prayer for us this morning. Dear Jesus, thank you for helping us through times when our backpacks and our burdens feel very heavy. Help us to cast our burdens on you and rely on your strength. We ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, thanks, y'all. We'll see you soon. Bye. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we glorify you. We call you Almighty God because your strength is beyond measure, beyond our hope, beyond our imagination, beyond our understanding. That if you can hold everything in your hand, then our problems are that much easier for you to handle. God, if you can keep planets in orbit, if you can keep suns shining, then you can handle our deepest and darkest cry. And so we place that trust in you this morning as we worship. We glorify you in that ability. We ask that you would provide for us like never before. That as we cry out to you, you would hear us. As we struggle with sin, with sin and as we struggle with with heartache, and as we struggle with whatever burden we may be carrying, 
we give those to you so that you can give us your light yoke. God, we praise you because you can do that. We praise you not just because you can do it, but because you want to. And your heart longs for a people who will just say, God, not our will, but yours. Provide for us. Care for us. And when we forget that you are the one who is capable, and when we run in our own direction, and we think we know better, we pray that your spirit would draw us back to you and on towards perfection. God, we lift up those in this congregation. We lift up those in this community that need your almighty power this morning, that need your comfort, your grace, and your forgiveness because we know you are eager to pour it out on us. And so as we lift these concerns and as we place our trust in you and as we love you with every aspect of our life, we pray together the way all the saints who have come before us have prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time in our service, we would uh, traditionally be taking up the offering. The ushers would be moving among you. And of course, we're no longer doing that. Or we'll remind you that there are offering boxes on your way out. And if you want to drop something in there of a paper variety or coins or anything else, we'll be glad to receive it. But it's also a time for us to be thankful for the gift that is given to us through our music. And with that, let's meditate and consider God's presence with us as Carol leads us.
Our scripture reading today is found in the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning with the 17th verse. Hear the word of God. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's speak to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, open our minds to these words and open our hearts to the living word of Christ that we may be changed today and forever. Amen. On the evening of September 8th, 1923, Nine destroyers of the United States Navy ran aground at Honda Point just off of Santa Barbara in California. Seven of the ships were a total loss. Twenty-three sailors lost their lives in the mishap. The destroyer Squadron 11 was on its way from San Francisco down the coast to San Diego and had turned into what they thought was the Santa Barbara Channel. Now, the lead ship in the squadron had new radio navigation gear, but the captain did not trust all that technology and preferred to use his own sense of dead reckoning. As they moved through the channel, they didn't stop to take soundings because that would have slowed down their progress, and they plowed into the rocks at 20 knots, losing seven of the nine ships and tragic consequences that came to the lives of those sailors. The accident at Honda Point remains the single largest loss of ships in the peacetime United States Navy. Traveling in shallow waters is risky business. And we're taking a look at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaching to us as the master teacher going back to school with him as we learn to walk in his ways. Last week, as we took a look at the Beatitudes, we learned about how to live a joyful way, being happy in spite of our circumstances, no matter what's going on around us. This morning, Jesus teaches us about a different way, a deeper way, one that goes beyond shallow legalism, and goes beyond mere rules and regulations, the do's and the don'ts. It's a life in which the spirit of the law matters more than the letter of the law. Now, the law was critical to the ancient Israelites. The law and the prophets were the balances that kept religious life moving. The law, of course, had been given by God in the Ten Commandments, but as the centuries progressed, Those had been expanded and expanded and expanded, and they seemed now at this point to serve to exist just to take care of people, no longer concerned with God. By the time of Jesus, these commandments had produced a cold, heartless religion, and what had been Ten Commandments in the beginning had been now inflated by the religious leaders to a law of 613 different regulations. There were 248 things you had to do, and there were 365 things you were prohibited from doing. You had to keep up. It was time to get back to basics, Jesus said. And he affirmed the need for the law, but then he went one step further. Verse 17 Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He was trying to help the people then and the people now 
to understand that we are to live a deeper life. He challenges us to pursue a deeper spirituality. Verse 20, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. It would be like me saying to you that in order for you to be righteous, your spirituality has to be stronger than the most committed missionary who goes to the remote parts of the earth and lives and dies there in service to the Lord. Or your spirituality has to be stronger than the most austere monk in the most austere monastery who does nothing but pray all day long. Now, how can we do that? Well, there's no, no way. It's a question, though, of internal rather than external obedience. Even today, many Christians live out a life of shallow spirituality, going through the motions, maintaining a veneer of Christianity and moral values, but not really knowing the deeper motivations as to why. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is trying to help us find a vital faith a deeper faith, going beyond rules toward righteousness. And to make a point, Jesus gives us several examples. Verse 21, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Verse 27, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Verse 31, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Verse 33, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all. Verse 38, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Verse 43, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Boom, boom, boom. Jesus just hits one thing after another. Several examples of where we are called to go beyond the letter of the law to the spirit of the law. And that is much more difficult. Don't murder? Well, Jesus says, why don't we get to the root cause of murder, which is deep seated brooding anger. Jesus says, give it up. Be reconciled to those who have hurt you. Get over it and get on with your life before something worse happens. Adultery? Jesus says, stay clear of anything which leads in that direction. Lust is an insatiable desire for something we can't have or are unable to obtain and it only leads to bad behavior. For instance, in our world, online pornography is now growing by leaps and bounds and destroying lives and families in the process. We are responsible for our own lives, so we should act accordingly. Put a filter on the internet. If that doesn't work, get rid of the computer. Better that than losing your soul. What about divorce? Some of you have been divorced probably, and I would guess that almost all of us have family members or friends who have as well. Now, all too often, the church has been one of the most difficult places of all for divorced persons to find healing and hope. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Yes, the Bible says that God hates divorce, but I will tell you that pretty much anybody that's been involved with divorce hates divorce as well. Life happens. 
But healing and hope are possible through Jesus Christ. Here's the background of what Jesus is saying. In the first century, wives were pretty much property, and they were very much at the mercy of their husbands, who could simply just let them go and issue a divorce. No attorneys, no divorce courts. Burn the breakfast, you're out of here. Didn't clean the house, you're gone. Pick up a few pounds, a few wrinkles, yesterday's news. Jewish society had come to the point where divorce was no longer a last resort. It was the first option. Who says the Bible isn't relevant today? Jesus is holding the people of God to a higher standard than the world sets. The issue is not divorce. The issue is fidelity, faithfulness. When people get married, they should take their covenant vows seriously, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. If we cannot maintain sacred commitments to one another who we see, how in the world can we maintain a sacred commitment to God who we cannot see? Speaking of vows, Jesus talks about honesty. He mentions oaths in particular. Now, people then and now assume that in order to make sure something sticks, that somebody's telling us, they have to make a promise to take an oath. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, right? But that's not good enough because we know people lie under oath, so we also have to have perjury laws. And it, the list just keeps going. Jesus says it doesn't need to be like that. If you mean yes, say yes. If you mean no, say no. Following Jesus requires a commitment to live the truth. Well, what about revenge? Have you ever heard someone say, I don't get mad, I get even? Jesus didn't say that. In fact, he said just the opposite. Don't seek revenge. Turn the other cheek. Give them the shirt off your back. Go the extra mile. That doesn't mean that you turn yourself into some doormat. What it means is that you resist the need to get even. Break that cycle. Don't let others determine your response. It's not about getting even. It's about giving grace. Finally, Jesus talks about love. Loving those who love you. That's easy. Anyone can do that. But loving those who hate you, well, that's a whole different thing. The Old Testament does indeed say love your neighbor, but others later on assume that because God said love your neighbor, well, then you ought to hate your enemy. And that's not the way it works. Jesus says we are to treat others the same way God treats all of us. And he loves us even when we are quite unlovable. We are to do good to our enemies, to bless them, and to pray for them, hard as that may be. And in doing so, we will do no less than Jesus does for us. Now, in using all of these examples, Jesus is challenging us to deal with the root cause of our actions namely sin, capital S, capital I, capital N. Sins, little s sins, are the things we do wrong. Sin, S-I-N, is the motivation that leads us to do wrong things. If we deal with sin, big S, then we will automatically be taking care of sins with the little s. Jesus is raising the bar. Now, traditionally, when rabbis were teaching in this kind of manner, they would say, thus saith the Lord. Well, Jesus changes that formula, and he says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Jesus wasn't speaking for God. Jesus was speaking as God. And that gives a whole different significance to the last part of what he says. Verse 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect. Talk about the biggest challenge of all. Be perfect. Did Jesus really mean that? 
Well, yes. Yes, I think he did. In the Methodist tradition, we refer, we refer to this idea of Christian perfection or perfect love, that we're not always going to be perfect in how we carry out our actions, but we are to be perfect in our intentions. And that can, in fact, come about by the power of the Holy Spirit that works within us to transform our lives. As we place our lives under God's Spirit, then we will be changed daily into the very image of Jesus Christ, reflecting His characteristics in our life for all to see. And then we will have holiness of heart and life. Now, we can't achieve that on our own. We only do so by the grace of the one who said, Father, forgive them as he hung dying on the cross. Words spoken to the very people who had hung Jesus there. Jesus offered them a prayer. He offers us a prayer, that same prayer on our behalf. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus shows us a way through his own actions on how to live a deeper life. You know, it's funny what you remember as you look back across your life. One of my weirdest memories that I remember was when I was about six. We had just moved to a new place, and the family across the street from us had a pool. Well, I wasn't a very good swimmer at age six, but I didn't want to be embarrassed with all the new kids in the neighborhood. So when I would go to their pool, I stayed away from the deep end and walked around in the shallow end. But not to be content with that, I would walk around just to where I was shoulder deep in the water. And as I walked, I would do this. And then I would even turn my head, pretending I was swimming so that they wouldn't know I really didn't know how to swim. That's kind of pitiful, isn't it? <laughs> pitiful. Sadly, that same attitude can carry with us into our adult lives. And there comes a time in each of our lives when we've got to quit pretending. When we've got to quit going through the motions and really start swimming. There comes a time when we have to get out of the shallow end and go to the deep end. And until we do, we're not fooling anybody, least of all God. Jesus is calling us to a deeper way of life. Are we willing to accept the challenge? Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you give us so many good gifts when we are unworthy of any gift at all. Best of all, you've given us your son, Jesus, to show us the way to the kingdom of heaven. It's not easy. Lord, your son has challenged us to a very, very difficult life, one that is fulfilling, but one that requires us to be committed Help us to walk faithfully. Help us to seek after your will, not following the law, but following the Spirit. God, do within us everything that you would have done so that it would be for our good and your glory. In Christ we pray. Amen. I'll remind you as we prepare to dismiss, the ushers will be coming to get you. We'll be asking you to move in toward the center aisles. They'll start at the back, work toward the front. It's the old last shall be first principle. Just think like you're at a wedding. So thank you for being here so much. It's a blessing to see you all in real life. And for those at home, thanks for watching. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and evermore. And all God's people said, Amen.